uh, Professor Rupi Pavanka. She is the president of uh, Asia Pacific Association of Allergy, Asthma, and Clinical Immunology. Uh, she is the past president of World Allergy Organization since 2012 to 2013. She is a council member of Collegium International Allergologicum. Uh, she is a professor department of pediatrics, uh, Nippon Medical School, Tokyo. She is also guest professor, Showa University School of Medicine, Tokyo. And she is an honorary professor of Capital Medical University of Beijing, capital city in China. She is a major awards, her major awards. World Allergy Organization Gold Medal Award, the Prasiva Bratiava Samman Award in Medicine from President of India, International Distinguished Fellow Award of uh, American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology. She published so many such nice uh, publications. Uh, her publication is uh, 500. 92 and each increase of 80. It's a very high. And also citation number is uh, uh, 43,000 citations. Now she is a editor, Journal of uh, Current Opinion, uh, Allergy Immunology, uh, also Clinical Experimental Allergy. Uh, she published the following books. It's an allergy frontier. Also, w, uh, World Allergy Organization White Book on Allergy. President elect of Apache and uh, myself, the president of Apache. And we have our great privilege, as always, to partner with the Mongolian Society of Allergology at your conference. So, and today I will talk on allergen immunotherapy as a prototype of precision medicine in asthma and AR, and a little bit on the impact on climate change. But before I do that, let me extend our heartiest congratulations on behalf of myself and on behalf of Professor Julia Wang and all the leadership of Apache. I would like to give a hearty congratulations to the Mongolian Society of Allergology on your 20th anniversary. We are so proud of you and you are such an important society in our Apache family and Apache community. So hearty congratulations. I would also just pick up some few memories that we have the many times that we came to Mongolia uh, over the years, and we've had wonderful hospitality and good scientific interaction. And you can see all the happy faces here. We are so happy to be in Mongolia. This is Professor Dia Wang and myself here. As you can see, we are with all of you and very, very happy faces. So before I go on to the next this thing, I would like to now uh, talk a little bit about the Atopic March. So we know that allergic diseases are not just um, asthma and allergic rhinitis, but we have food allergies and we have eczema and multiple different manifestations. Basically, it's a systemic disease, like we talk about rheumatoid arthritis, which is systemic. But the traditional concept of atopic mass started with eczema, followed by food allergies and then respiratory allergies. But nowadays in clinical practice, what you can see that there is no such format. You often see polynosis or seasonal allergic rhinitis or even dust mite allergic rhinitis, even as early as two years. And also asthma symptoms very often induced, of course, by viral, but also an allergen sensitization. So the typical pattern of atopic march is not exactly there. There is a lot of overlapping of these diseases. When we look at the global burden of allergy, we talk about so many diseases. We talk about the costs of SARS, we talk about the costs of so many other TB, we talk about the HIV and so many other diseases. 
But when you look at the cost of allergic rhinitis and asthma alone among all the others, and this is what we published in way back in 2014 in the World Allergy Organization Journal and also in our white book, you can see that across the different continents, the, there is a huge burden on just allergic rhinitis and asthma alone. In addition, we have so many other allergic diseases. When we talk about the pathomechanisms of allergic rhinitis, I won't go into the details for want of time. We know that there is a barrier dysfunction. We know that the allergens and uh, of course, further aggravated by viruses can actually trigger the inflammatory mechanism leading to release of TS2 type of cytokines, the sensitization of mast cells, uh, the, then the TS2 type cells and migration of these into the bone marrow, stimulating the um, progenitors to release other uh, progenitor cells into the um, peripheral blood. And then they go into the um, uh, upper and lower airways. And now we also know that the epithelial cells are no longer just like a cell at the outer surface. They not only act as a barrier um, uh, cell, but they also are an important immune cell, releasing TS TSLP, IL-25, IL-33, and a variety of other cytokines like TNF-alpha, IL-6, and so on. And the epithelial cell, immune cell interaction also is extremely important. So all these together lead to the early phase and the late phase allergic response. Now, when you talk about the link between rhinitis and asthma, again, we can see here that these TS2 type cells migrate to the bone marrow, stimulate the progenitors, and they come into the tissue, I mean, come into the peripheral blood. They mature to pro, uh, mature eosinophils and basophils, and then they migrate to the airways because of an upregulation of adhesion molecules and a release of chemoattractants. So this happens both from allergic rhinitis leading to asthma, but also asthma leading to uh, allergic rhinitis, but more often from the upper airway to the lower airway. Now, when we talk about the treatment of allergic rhinitis, there are many treatments. And we know the ARIA guidelines were first published in, 1990, uh, in 2001, and it was developed in the World Health Organization in 1999 when all of us got together under the leadership of Professor John Busquet and Paul Van Kovenberg. And of course, it has been updated many times. But this is an interesting uh, next generation ARIA guidelines, which shows the great evidence versus real world evidence. The initial ARIA guideline was using the shekel and now the grade is the highest level of evidence. So RCTs versus real world evidence. And real world evidence is very important because in reality, we are not a particular, uh, in. Uh, we are not really uh, in a situation that the poor patient has only no comorbid, comorbid patient has multiple diseases. So we need to see what is the real world data and how does it fit in with the randomized clinical trials. So as you can see here in the upper airways, uh, in allergic rhinitis, oral antihistamines are less potent than intranasal corticosteroids. And of course, the other important point is that in severe allergic rhinitis, intranasal corticosteroids are the first line of therapy. Again, you can see a uh, grade five uh, evidence and that RCT and uh, real world evidence also show the same data. What I'd like to highlight here is often we talk about combination of in, uh, intranasal corticosteroids and oral antihistamines. And we do use that very often in clinical practice. But when you look at the data, it does not really offer much. And some of the real world evidence also does not show any evidence of that. But of course, in clinical practice, we do use it. And we also use in combination with antileukotrines. But nowadays, we understand that there are phenotypes and endotypes of uh, disease. We see that in chronic rhinosinusitis. We see that in asthma. And we are gradually seeing it in many atopic dermatitis and many other different diseases. And as you can see here, although we have biologics now, like uh, uh, anti-IG or anti-IL-13 or anti-IL-5 and so on, and the alpha receptor, alpha chain. So all these different biologics or anti-TSLP that's coming up. But the most important thing is that allergen immunotherapy is a prototype of precision medicine. So allergen immunotherapy was the first, uh, very first format of precision medicine, even before we really coined the term precision medicine. Now, uh, I'm sorry if I'm going a little bit fast, 
but uh, yeah, I'll try to be a little bit slower. So basically in allergen immunotherapy, we are targeting the allergen specific IgE. So when we are ta targeting the allergen specific IgE, so it is more precision medicine. It is not like pharmacotherapy that acts across uh, every uh, kind of allergy. So in case of AIT as precision medicine, what are the factors that are important? You have to identify the molecular mechanism of the disease. And here we know the molecular mechanism is IgE, the effector cells, the binding of allergen and component, the mediator release and symptoms. So the molecular mechanism is proven. The diagnostic tool for the molecular mechanism. Here, the diagnostic tool for the molecular me mechanism is the IgE itself to the uh, particular allergen, as well as the component that is detected. So within uh, the allergen, we also identify the component. The third important thing of precision therapy is treatment blocking the molecular mechanism. Is it effective? And this again, we have shown that when you block the mechanism, using treatment that is allergen immunotherapy, it can actually block the molecular mechanism. So these three criteria, which are essential to identify a treatment as precision therapy is uh, proven for allergen immunotherapy. Now, again, as you can see here, we know that the TH2 dominance, TH2 type is dominant in allergen, uh, uh, in the allergic reaction. And what happens in allergen immunotherapy, there is an upregulation of the T regulatory cells and therefore a switch from TH2 to TH1. And I'm not going to go into the details, but basically uh, this results on the long term, there is a downregulation of uh, IgE, not immediately, but there is an upregulation of IgG for, for antibodies. Now, when we target allergen immunotherapy to the right patients, this is very important. If we do not give the right extract, if we do not do a right diagnosis, and we do not identify the right patient, and we, pay, we say that the treatment is not effective, then it is um, pointless. So we have to look at that. Again, we have to also consider the patient's needs and preferences. Say, for example, some patient doesn't want to have immunotherapy. They want to only have pharmacotherapy. So even if you give them, it's not going to be uh, useful because it, they are not compliant. There is a lack of compliance. And therefore, uh, these are the factors that are very important. So patient education is very, very important when you decide to give immunotherapy in advance of deciding it. And that also helps in the adherence. So basically, uh, it is given in moderate uh, to severe allergic rhinitis, not so commonly in intermittent allergic rhinitis, but moderate to severe persistent allergic rhinitis, especially, uh, uh, of course, when pharmacotherapy is not effective, but in, in the recent guidelines and the recent recommendation, it is said that even if you do not have uh, uh, tried pharmacotherapy, if you explain to the patient and the patient wants the long-term benefit and wants to be free from the symptoms after treatment of uh, about three years with immunotherapy, we give them the choice and we do that. Uh, we give them immunotherapy. So the targeting of AIT to the right patients means a correct diagnosis of allergic rhinitis, moderate to severe, uh, persistent rhinitis, consider AIT to those who are wishing and in those who have actually uh, failed pharmacotherapy. Now, when we talk about immunotherapy, there is the injectable immunotherapy or the SCIT, and there is also the sublingual immunotherapy. And this was the uh, latest uh, um, uh, update on the sublingual immunotherapy by the World Allergy Organization. During my presidency, the initial paper was, of course, done. The consensus was done during Walter Canonica's presidency in 2009. And this is the update that happened in 2013. So what I would like to hear, uh, highlight here is there are many things like about slit, you know, like single allergen slit is effective, but in both monosensitized and polysensitized patients. And of course it is useful in other forms of allergic disease like food allergy or latest allergy as venom uh, uh, for venom, like venom immunotherapy. But importantly is failure of pharmacotherapy is not the only prerequisite for use of sublingual immunotherapy you may consider it as the first line of treatment. And this is what I have said before also. 
The other important thing when you give immunotherapy, whether it is slit or skip, is the importance of product-specific evidence. And this is something that uh, the, uh, Wow and Yaki together, when I was president, we went to EMA and we tried to ask for a kind of uh, harmonization of the criteria, harmonization of the studies, harmonization of what are the factors that go into a study, what should be the primary outcomes, what should be the secondary outcomes, how do we evaluate the products? These things were actually uh, discussed over there. And now it is going to become a very strict regulation, even especially in Germany, that you have to have a product specific evidence because there are so many products in the market and which are not studied. And of course, there, there is heterogeneity in the outcomes, even for the similar products. So we published a paper called Product-Based Evaluation, a WOW statement that was led by Klaus. Again, it started during my presidency and then uh, published later on. And what I'd like to just highlight here is this important part that every, at least one successful state-of-the-art double-blind placebo-controlled randomized trial should be done in adults. And also in children, there should be at least one state-of-the-art a confirmatory trial in children for the first year of treatment. So these two criteria are absolutely additional, uh, you know, sustained effects can be there, but minimum we should have this for both the skit as well as for slit. So that is the criteria if a particular product is uh, to be used in clinical practice. So what do we expect? The optimal selection of AIT, the expected proven outcomes, what would be the value? The onset of efficacy should be early, the maximum efficacy one to two years and long-term efficacy at least three years. So this is very important. Now, when we talk about onset of efficacy, unlike pharmacotherapy, you do not get the efficacy just the night, in, in a few hours or in a few uh, days. Uh, but what is interesting is even though the actual effects takes uh, over six months or so, but you can see that the onset of efficacy actually happens quite early. So you can see the IL-10 induction and suppression of the late phase reaction is even as early as two to four weeks. And that the IgG4 inhibitory antibody activity and suppression of the early phase response can be seen as early as eight to 16 weeks. And the other important thing is looking at the long-term efficacy. The long-term efficacy, you can see the sustained benefit for at least one year post IIT. So, but a minimum of three years is required especially for seasonal, but also for houses mine, you need to give at least for three years to have a sustained benefit for at least one year post EIT. AIT. And then, of course, if you give it for three years, very often it has even shown five years to seven years of remission. So again, as you can see here, first year of treatment, second year of treatment, you can see sustained efficacy for at least one year, sustain efficacy as early as one year with the house dust my uh, slit tablet. And this again has been compiled together in an updated guideline that was published by the Yaki in which we were part of that uh, guideline. Okay, this, uh, this is their latest guideline on allergen immunotherapy for both allergic rhinitis and rhinoconjunctivitis. And here again, it highlights that to improve the adherence, patients should be informed about how immunotherapy works and they should be um, uh, guided to take regular doses and complete the course of treatment for the long-term benefits. Now in COVID, what was the situation? Now in COVID, the recommendation was if the patient is infected with COVID-19, do not give immunotherapy. You stop the immunotherapy at that stage. So interrupting subcutaneous immunotherapy, interrupting sublingual immunotherapy is advised, and both should be discontinued in symptomatic patients. But once they are free from their disease and they are uh, found to be negative, then of course it could be restarted. Now, the important thing out there is that when you restart, sometimes, you know, for, for sublingual immunotherapy, you can continue at home, but in case of subcutaneous immunotherapy, if they cannot come to the clinic, you can even have a certain uh, a phase of stopping the treatment and then restart from the prior dose uh, once they are able to come uh, and visit in the hospital. 
Then before I end my talk, I just like to say a few words about uh, climate change because that is an important initiative that Apache has taken forward. We just had Apache Allergy Week. Professor Mumbaiar was uh, and Professor Wang were together with me with many others as part of this uh, initiative. And we have a continued uh, initiative of this with the United Nations. And you will hear more about this from Professor Mumbaiar in his talk. But just a few things. We know that there are different types of uh, air pollutants. There are outdoor pollutants and the indoor pollutants. And they are gaseous and they're particulate matter of the outdoor pollutant. So as you can see here, these are the different forms of uh, uh, outdoor pollutants and the sources of those outdoor pollutants. And you can see also PM 2.5, PM 10 and so on being important causes of uh, pollution. Now, what does it actually do? They, of course, they affect the human body directly by loosening up of the tight junctions, damaging the epithelial barrier, causing many inflammatory responses, but they also adhere to the pollen and make the pollens more irritable and more allergic. And then what does climate change do? Climate change increases the amount of pollen, increases the allergenicity of pollen, increases germination rate, and they change the distribution of plants and uh, uh, trees. You can see like birch pollen never seen actually in Southern Europe today can be seen in Southern Europe and so on. And earlier start to the pollen season and longer pollen season. And we know today we are continuously faced with global warming and changing temperatures, heat strokes, flooding, forest fires, and so many things that are happening that are changing our daily life, that climate change is a huge problem and climate action should be a combined effort of multi-stakeholders. Uh, so the other thing that happens, which is related to allergic rhinitis, especially seasonal allergic rhinitis, is what happens when there is a thunderstorm. And this was actually published by uh, uh, Frank Thien from uh, Australia, and but it has been shown in many other parts of the world also. What exactly happens when, during the pollen season, if there is thunderstorm, the pollen grains get sucked up into the clouds, they are fragmented into small pieces, and then they descend into the uh, ground level as small particles as the size of PM 2.5. So when they actually become PM 2.5, unlike the usual pollen particles that cannot enter the airways, these 2.5 size particles enter the airways and they cause not only aggravation of rhinitis, but severe acute asthma attacks. And so there is hospitalization, there's emergency, and uh, it's a crisis. So you can see this is what happened in Melbourne. And many of them had current asthma. Many of them were of Indian and Asian uh, authenticity, uh, um, ethnicity. And then you can see here again that many of them had rhinitis. And this again shows that the rhinitis in these patients, if not controlled, if they're asthmatic, current asthma, if they had, and the asthma is not controlled by the inhalers, these patients are more likely to get severe attacks and even uh, can lead to death. So it's very, very important to actually um, uh, encourage the patients to have compliance. And during the COVID, generally we have seen that there is a good compliance by the patients. So in summary, I would like to say that allergen immunotherapy is a prototype of precision medicine. It has a unique immunological potential to achieve long-term disease and remission, uh, achieve full benefits of allergen immunotherapy. Patients need to be informed and empowered, and we have to choose the right patient and the right uh, extract or optimal selection of the product and motivate the patients uh, to take it properly. And finally, we also know that uh, but through epidemiological studies that both indoor and outdoor pollutions are uh, constantly aggravating asthma and allergic diseases in our region, and that global warming will only increase the effects of this uh, outdoor pollution. And last of all, I would like to invite you that on 21st, that is uh, uh, just four days from now, we will have again uh, Apache Masterclass with two international speakers, you know, Mariana Castle is the person who actually created the protocol for drug desensitization in the whole world. Her protocol is used everywhere. She is a fellow of Frank Austin. And then we have, of course, Lenny from Denmark. And we have two young people from our region of the JAFCA who are also speaking and moderated by also JAFCA member. So please be part of this uh, masterclass. Of course, registration is free. So join us. 
And finally, we also like to have many Mongolian young doctors to be uh, speaking at our future JAFCA meetings. And finally, uh, uh, without fail, I would like to invite you to Apache 2022 Pasai at 50, December 5 to 8, 2022. Please remember that we are, even though we had a virtual conference last year uh, in October, this is the first Congress we will have in person after four years. So please, we hope all the members of the Mongolian Society of Allergy can join us uh, at this Congress. So Professor Jia Wang, myself, and Professor Lobo from the Philippine Society warmly invite you to join us at Apache 2022 Pasai at 50. And once again, a very hearty congratulations to the 20th anniversary of Mongolian Society of Allegology. We love you very much. Thank you for your very nice, very scientific and beautiful lecture. As I said in my um, initial talk uh, on the first that uh, we extend our heartiest congratulations to the Mongolian Society of Allegology for the 20th anniversary. We are, MSA is a proud uh, uh, organization of uh, Apache and we welcome the continued uh, collaboration uh, in all our initiatives. Uh, so we look forward to long-term uh, continued relationship. Um, with this warm greetings from us, uh, congratulating uh, the Mongolian Society of Allegology, I also like to introduce the next speaker. It's my great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Mumbaya, who is, doesn't really need an introduction because all of you know him. He's a president of the Mongolian Society of Allegology. But um, to do justice, I will just say a few words. Uh, he is actually um, heading the Department of Pulmonology and Allergy in the School of Medicine of the Mongolian National University of Medical Sciences. And he is a very, very scientific person, published a lot of papers, and uh, he has done many initiatives. And in fact, in Apache, he has actively worked uh, for many of our um, uh, surveys and publications and also has um, uh, given us many opportunities to collaborate together uh, and be part of the MSA meeting uh, in Ulaanbaatar uh, when we could have had in-person meetings. I'm also glad uh, about the good collaboration between Professor Wang and Professor Mumbayar and I look forward to joining together in this collaboration as a team that we do uh, together with three countries and also maybe beyond uh, our region. I also am very happy to see Arya uh, so in this meeting and the warm greetings to her. So without um, any more want of time, I, I give the floor to Professor Mumbaya who will talk about climate change and also vitamin D. Professor Mumbaya. Uh, 